welcome to yet another episode of the new space india podcast as a part of learning from other emerging new space ecosystems i thought australia was a very unique case here is a country that had initial enthusiasm about space activities in the 60s and the 70s which died down later and then heavily dependent on us imports for its satellite based needs of course it had a large enough downstream industry in mining agriculture and others that could absorb some of these products however in the last 10 years or so there's a new wave of new space companies in australia that have emerged and as of today there are about 80 to 100 companies that have been operating in australia in the last 10 years that fall in the new space domain these companies are trying to take a novel approach of trying to create original products and services out of australia for the first time my guest today is jason held ceo of saber astronautics one of those early companies that started out in australia at a time when there were not many of these new space companies around i know jason for several years now and i've seen saber astronautics mature from a startup to a thriving SME. In this episode of the podcast, I wanted to reflect on how Australia matured as a country that can support emerging startups and put a framework and funding programs for them to mature. Given that Jason has seen it all in the last 10 to 12 years shuttling between Australia and the US, he provides some unique perspectives on how the overall ecosystem has emerged and matured over the last 10 years i'm sure that there is quite a lot of learning for several of the new space entrepreneurs through jason's experience in australia that we can replicate or try to take inspiration in india i hope that the policy makers in india get more awareness of such measures taken by other countries and act in favor of helping india's own new space companies jason welcome to this episode of the new space india podcast uh, thank you very much for taking your time out uh, during this very nice summer at least here in europe for us uh, to talk to me oh no it's fantastic you know it, it a lot of people in the audience don't know but narayan uh, you and i we've not actually known each other for years you know so uh, it, it, it's almost like our startups have grown up together and 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 as we both kind of get out of that 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 little startup be seeing now we could really help each other and it's it's kind of exciting absolutely so tell us a little bit about your background because you are of course now in based in australia and were in the us and so it's an interesting mix what uh, is your background and what brought you to australia um well i i i entered the space industry 1999 Uh so I was a space engineer originally out of Colorado worked on Hubble and ISS and flight software um I was with Space Command on the army side and I uh, did some military deployments as part of Space Command uh and uh, I was getting promoted and went to Australia to get a a, a master's degree I ended up with a PhD and a wife and never left and and uh one of the things was I started uh Saber Astronautics from Australia and uh formed two companies actually Saber USA and Saber Australia and built both of those up as as time went on over the course of years and uh, of course the, the the plan was my my wife uh, she she works in the pharmaceutical industry she was like look uh if we stay in Australia you could do whatever you want to do and eventually you could take over the money stuff and and I'll I'll quit my job but in the meantime you have fun and do something new um and so uh being in australia building a space company at a time when there was no space companies in us in australia it was, it was from at least for for what i'm doing there was larger us uh consortiums and a couple of other australian uh companies have been around but like from a startup and new space standpoint there was really nothing so it was it was quite exciting cuz not only do you have to build the company but you also get a chance to you know, kind of like what you're you're doing in india now right? is you're building an industry essentially right Australia already has a uh, a pretty extensive space background right because they had the Woomera 
launch space where some of the European rocket uh, was launched and then they had a history of doing space in a certain way, but they kind of lost track of space after a certain time. Yeah, for, for a while, 50s and 60s, they wanted to be a space power, kind of like uh, the, the UK, kind of similar past. Uh, and and uh, my understanding was, um, yeah, they, it's a very conservative country, you know, so if they're feeling that another country is doing the work, they don't have to, then, then you know, they, they, they don't do it. But, you know, like I said, when, when, when I first came to Australia, it, it was from, a, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, it was quite dead. But what you realize is uh, Australia has always been very strong academically in space. We were always top 10 uh, of, of the nations in terms of the amount of papers we produce and, and the impact of the papers uh, from an academic output standpoint. Australia is, is, is a powerhouse. Um, from an economic standpoint, we've always been an importer of American goods and sometimes European goods. Uh, and, and that's been true up until just a couple of years ago when uh, the, the new space market started to grow out here and the Australian government saw that uh, and, and noticed, hey, we've got 90 new space companies just in the last you know, four years alone, massive growth in, in new space. Uh, and that's the story of, of itself. I could talk for ages on that. So. What is the catalyst that uh, you know, brought new space together in Australia? Um, I, it's a mix. Uh, on, on one side, it's, it's the market and, and CubeSats. Uh, uh, Australian investors tend to watch what happens in Silicon Valley. And so they, they, there's usually like a two or three year delay in the Australian response. But uh, Silicon Valley was, was uh, putting early money into CubeSats when nobody else was. A few years later, the Australian uh, investment community realized that, you know what, there's some opportunity uh, I, I think a lot of these kind of CubeSat university projects were also thinking the same things and they were starting to spin out. Um, I did a lot of work uh, pushing it as well, personally. Um, I was doing a lot of presentations and conferences just trying to show people that you could do it. Uh, and I think the fact that Sabre never died, <laughs> you know, was, was, a, was a part of that. Um, but, uh, you know, the credit really does go to the people who wanted to give it a go, and, and it takes a lot of courage. And, and Australia, uh, per capita for a while, was one of the top two countries, top three countries in the world for per capita for doing entrepreneurialism. Um, so uh, from a technical standpoint, way behind, you know, countries like India, you know, you, you know India is like you know, sixth in the world for space output, I think fifth these days. Uh, yeah, at, at the time, Australia was dead last for that. But in terms of, of companies that were starting from nothing, uh, we catapulted up. Um, I think only Silicon Valley had the largest number of startups per capita. Um, and compared to where I came from, like I, I, I was living in Colorado and, and Sabre USA is based in, in Boulder in Colorado Springs. Right. So that, that's kind of where we sit. And when we were pitching our business on the U.S. side, uh People were surprised. They were like, wow, a space star. We're not used to that. And it was almost like Australia and, and, and had kind of catapulted past that for, for a short time. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's kind of that's kind of how it happened. It's literally um, a, a mix of market plus moxie uh, plus uh, intention mixed with also, and this is important, this bit's important. The Australian community always felt like they didn't have a chance to play in space, okay? So when you go at the ground level, at the engineer level, at, at uh, graduating, what's a fourth year engineering student gonna do when they graduate in Australian University? Back in 2009, 2010, nothing. They're going to Railcore, they're going to, to the banking sector if they've got algorithms. They're desperately, desperately trying to go to the United States. Uh, and um, the rest of them, the ones who didn't leave, were like, you know what, let's try it. And, and those of who actually tried it have become uh, some of the, the kind of healthier startups that we have today. And that's the story. I did remember, you know, this trip that you made to I India. I did remember, in you know, the trip suppose, that you made to right? India in 2013. Yeah, 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 suppose, that's right. right? I, I did two trips, uh, one, one year after the other. But um, yeah, it's about, it's about right, 2013, 2014. 
what did you see in india in terms of uh, you know space what did you see in india in terms of what was going uh, on in the us and then reflecting back and then with what was going on in the us and then i in saw some and then fascinating similarities between australia and india in terms of academic output uh, i i went to manipal institute at the tech i uh, i went to uh, mumbai uh, iit mumbai uh, met the students there gave some talks um saw some of the the, the, the motivation is exactly the same it's it, it, india is a bit different because you have space heritage and, and a, a stronger space history than australia does uh, and you have a i would call it comparable to to the us in terms of um uh, i guess structure right so uh very nationalized structure very government driven uh, if you're part of that sort of government scene, then 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 you you can you can uh, play in space. A lot of the similar motivations from the students I talked to, saying I want to be a part of space. How do I do it? Trying to to connect the leg bone to the knee bone, uh, and finding it difficult. Um, and you would get like the cream of the crop would make it into the government program. So very very the the top students would make it in. Uh, and everybody else is sitting there like, what do I do with all these space skills? How do I apply it? Um, so I, I, I think from an entrepreneurial potential, it's it's still there. Um, and I, I, I could see some signs of life. I was actually going to ask you about that. But, you know, what, what's changed on in, in your side? I think, uh, you know, it's a very interesting comparison because uh, from what I see, new space in Australia and new space in India is almost uh, has the same roots of the timing. But as you said, uh, you have now almost, uh, I don't know, 100 companies in Australia trying to do space, I suppose, and uh, and the government actually providing a, a tremendous amount of grants and support and, and not really competing. Uh, and that's exactly, you know, the underlying issue, right, where you have a legacy space program that is kind of trying to, you know, kind of protect its own turf, I would say, and uh, and it's kind of confused about what is exactly new space uh, when you when you talk about India, but uh, and and in Australia, I guess you know the benefit that the Australian system has is that the space agency is somehow I don't see it at least from an external viewpoint of uh, somebody who is trying to you know build uh, engineering base by itself or build uh, facilities or or something by itself and have uh, government nominated scientists or building stuff, but, but it's more taking an entrepreneurial view of supporting the ecosystem. Is that right? Yeah, there's an important distinction. Uh, first of all, I think that's correct, uh, especially when you talk in terms of how the national strategic need is viewed in, in either country. Both of them see a national strategic need for space. The big difference, uh, and you have a gap at the ground level where, where entrepreneurs have a hard time of getting academic graduates. They have a hard time of getting in. It's, it's seen as a as a pedestal industry, right? It's, you have to be so high to ride the, the, the Ferris wheel sort of an industry. The big difference is India builds their own technology. They like building their own technology. You like building your own technology. If you're an Indian citizen, if, 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 if you're, if, if, you know, the, the history of the country, uh, you know, even though it's, it's compacted in the government very much, you're still that kind of feeling like we, ha we are doing this. This is our thing. Australians have always bought from overseas. And that's a big difference, right? So the purchaser, the one who's got the money in their hand, like Australia spends three to four billion a year on space goods, but it's all on import. Like their tax structure is, is, is they, they give uh, benefits for companies that import technology from overseas. And, and that took a lot of lobbying on our part just to, just to get people to notice that. Um, so, but it, it is changing. I think you're right. It is, it is changing. There's a lot of grants in the Australian government now. The space agency is, is definitely on board with building a local market and, and advocating for local purchasing. There are still a lot of blockers, um, mostly coming from, from overseas, a lot of lobbying from overseas companies. But we knew that was going to happen. Um, and I think right now the Australian uh, ecosystem is trying to find that balance between the tech that we know we need to bring in and, and the tech we want to build ourselves and how do we link them together, I think is, is kind of the motivation in Australia right now. So what was the, 
you know, background to Australia setting up the space agency and, you know, what does the space agency do in terms of its relation with the industry? Um, well, the background is, uh, is a, was a process of um, getting the government to notice that there was a need, not just a need for a space agency. It's it it actually need is the long term because as us space people, we like to say we need space because of A, B and C. The truth is we don't need space. We want space. We want to go to Mars. That's why we're all in it. Right? Yeah. I don't care if you're working on a CubeSat or you're writing some software. We're, we're all in it for the same thing. It's for the exploration. Uh, and, and government, that's not going to resonate with government. government. So a lot of the arguments that, that I was putting forward um, was uh, to talk about the opportunity and the growth. So the initial discussions around it, um, and, and keep in mind the heavy lobbying for many years was an anti-lobby. It was don't have a space agency, right? It was we have everything we need from overseas. Don't do anything different. Uh, don't rock the boat. And um, I had to rock the boat and piss a lot of people off uh, and, and really just disrupt it. So I, I found a, the guy who actually got the message across um, was uh, a gentleman in the business community. I, he doesn't normally like having me mention his name publicly. He's, he's, he's an older businessman, uh, very wealthy and, and connected. Uh, but I, I had, he'd watched uh, Saber struggle in her early years and kind of breached that, that the gap uh, where where the, the valley of death, as we call it, uh, between startup and scale up. Uh, and he watched us go through it. Uh, and and he started asking questions about the industry and the market. We got to talking about it, and uh, I was able to show him the opportunity in terms of revenue. And it's quite simple: four hundred twenty billion dollar market, Australian, uh, and then growing, tripling over the next ten years. Okay, that's nice, but how do we relate that to Australia? I said, well, in Australia, you've got all these new startups. At the time, of the discussion there was thirty new startups, which is a lot. Forget about 90. That was 30. We were excited. Um, and I showed him that data point. And then he yeah, he, he brought in uh, uh, some politicians that he, he knew and trusted, and we discussed it more. Uh, they were still not hesitant, but they still wanted more information uh, to unpack it rather than just my back in the napkin sketch. So we formed a task force uh, that we called a tiger team. Um, you know, with uh, you know, Global Access Partners, which is the name of the, the like a think tank. Uh, and we invited members of the, of the space industry to do a deep dive on the market for Australia. And we painted a picture that then got around to the community. So it's kind of like if you ever use the rumor system to get anything done, it, you know, and, and if, you, if you go straight to the top and, 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 and without that kind of ground game, then yeah, you know, they're not really going to uh, be interested. But but we really went at them with with, with both. We had that ground game of, of people, and what what really got exciting was everybody wanted to claim this for themselves. So I think that the space agency should do. That's when we knew we won. That's when we knew when the people who just six months earlier were saying we will never have a space agency. Remember, 2013 is a good good year to talk about. It, you would you wouldn't you wouldn't know this because it would be on your radar. But 2013, the Australian government had a policy document, the first space policy document they've had in in in, in over a decade. The 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 uh, um, uh, that described how they would interact with space, and the document was written by the space industry, uh, one of the space industry associations out there, and the people were very concerned about promoting too much to the government because they didn't, and their motivation was not to hold things back, but they didn't want the government to be scared of spending too much money, right? Think about what you need instead of what you want. So they had written a policy, the 2013 policy actually says we will not do rockets and we will not do satellites. Can you believe it? Can you imagine, right? So, so, uh, yeah, we, we had a, a couple of people t together in this tiger team that was able to kind of deep dive and say, how could we do it? Well, the answer that we came up with was centered around a strategy of public-private partnership, a space agency whose national strategic mission is to capitalize on the growth of the market, build local, and get into it. Uh, and and 
that com you know back with the community that was was now slowly coming on board with the idea um, it then became a competition to see who could approach their favorite politician to say this is actually a good idea uh, and it and it very quickly became a bipartisan uh, re requirement um, and uh, then announced at the at the uh, space conference in Adelaide in 2017. 2016. I'm losing track of time. Was, um, but yeah, that that's the whole story, man. That's the that's the that's how it happened, and and uh, yeah, then then I, I I was invited to be part of the expert reference group to design the space agency uh, right before the conference, uh, and and uh, that was a that that was a great experience too, because um, because you're sitting around and you're saying, what do we want this thing to look like, you know? And, and uh, by then, the, the amount of startups had you know, had grown to about you know, 90, uh, and they had this long list, and, and here we are. That's a very big contrast to what is happening in India, I suppose, where uh, with all the struggles of many of the startups for the last 10 years or so, there's almost no real uh, translation into any kind of government support, even after like 10 years of work. And um, I mean, there's a lot of lessons, I suppose, that we can take from seeing, uh, you know, the, the industry grow in Australia and how politicians actually need to be involved in uh, reforms. And, you know, that's the most uh, ridiculous thing that I see in India where almost nobody cares about uh, space when uh, you look at from a policy making perspective. It's delegated to most people who are running the space agency, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, I, I see where you're coming from, uh, and this might be one of the big differences: is the fact that we had no space agency, and these companies were growing up, and the market was growing, um, and the market is the common bit between India and Australia. The market is growing just as fast with you as it is with me. The difference is, without a space agency, the government was thinking: not only are we losing money and market opportunity, but what happens if these companies are successful? What do we do about it? We have no say in this growth we can't capitalize on it so there was that push pull um and had there been a space agency already uh it would have already been formed we would have had to work within a, a framework that might not suit our needs and so we really were in in a, in a way kind of kind of lucky for how it turned out so there are of course today companies trying to build rockets and satellites out of australia how does the regulatory framework work there now for them to get support, you know, to launch and to to you know export satellites or test their engines or whatever. It's a slow improvement, but it's a day day by day improvement. Um, it's it's uh, uh, it, there's a you're gonna you're gonna relate to this problem. Embedded government agencies that are used to buying their equipment and procuring in a certain way are gonna be slow to move. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. Um, and that's not a, a a problem, but it's a challenge. So acquisition programs do not happen overnight. Um, and and uh, the regulatory stand, well, regu you're asking about regulatory standpoint. Uh, the space agency has, has been, I would say, reasonably aggressive. Uh, and I say that in a positive way uh, with reaching out to the other government agencies, looking at the own regulatory requirements. Uh, every once in a while, you run across something uh, weird in, in, in terms of, uh, contracting and things like that, but from o overall, um, it is a is a constant struggle. But that struggle moves upward with with every year, so that's what it's looking like. Right, and uh, there's of course, I think uh, you know, you were one of the young companies. I remember uh, even Fleet Fleet had this uh, other educational, you know, Flavia had this other educational startup or something, right, which was pre Fleet and. And so there's a bunch of them. So what do you think in terms of the number of, uh, you know, new jobs that have been created by all these new companies in the last 10 years? What is the landscape like now? That's a good question. Uh, 90 new companies, about a third of those companies re received funding from C to Series A, which is actually a high percentage. Uh, a mm -hmm. few of the companies, and you mentioned Fleet, uh, received Series B funding. Um, so th th those will be a few. If you're measuring in terms of jobs compared to other industries, it's not going to be that impressive. Uh, you're talking um, maybe a thousand 
new jobs is, is my is my guess uh, across Australia. That would probably be a high guess, being objective. Um, I think the motivation is if 90 new companies, a third of them become C Series A uh, funding, then well, if if seed funding is going to be five, a team of five or six people, right? Uh, series A, Series A funding is going to be 20 people, maybe 15 people. Uh, and Series B funding, you're going to have a team of 50 right away. So the math actually lays out quite nicely where you're going to have your you know, 10,000 new employees, 20,000 employees, and, and a couple of billion in revenue. Because yeah, each of them are going to be like you know, Series B level company, you're going to be 50 million, 20, you know, 30 to 50 million a year is what you want to generate in revenue at that, at that point, in my opinion. Right. I mean, investors might might want to have more out of that. But realistically, uh, you're, you're talking about sales in the in the in the in the millions to tens of millions per company. Right. So, um, you know, even though you're talking startups and, and scale ups and things like that, you're talking about a lot of good opportunity. That's an interesting data point because, uh, of course, you know, the metrics are very different for each country. So what you talked about seed and series A the numbers almost become uh, 10 times more in India, I suppose, just because the manpower is much more cheaper. Yeah, yeah, hey man, look, look, look yeah, Australians, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's definitely different. Although I would argue, and I'm curious to see what you think about this, I would argue that um, the proper metric for success is not jobs, it's products. What do you think? I come from, you know, this trying to do a more software play in space now. So for us, I think uh, you, we look at this metric of, uh, let's say, revenue per employee. If we can increase that continuously, uh, that's what, you know, most successful like enterprise and, you know, software players and, and most of the lot of interesting companies do. Because if you can like say, we do like, I think Google does something like a million uh, dollars per employee or something like that, or even more, which is ridiculous. It, well, Silicon Valley is a special area. Like, like I couldn't, I would never put my company in the Valley. No way. It's just too expensive, you know, but uh, I mean, even, even Sydney is, is pretty expensive, but it's like Colorado expensive. That's not like Silicon Valley. I mean, nobody's going to be, um, yeah, you would have to be a Google or something like that to, to afford it. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting, right? Because we don't have companies like, you know, that are, uh, that build and scale at that level in space. And for me, it's al already interesting to see if we can replicate some of that kind of a model in the space industry. So, you can, you know, that's when I guess you generate a lot of interest uh, in the policy making at other realms, saying these are companies that can really build and scale to a level where we see, uh, you know, getting more support through that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't see Sabre scaling as a Google would scale. Uh, and and I, never, I never tried to make ourselves see it that way. Uh, I think trying to follow the Silicon Valley model of saying every startup has to be a unicorn or I won't back it is a failed model for, for anywhere outside of the Valley. Um, I mean, even in the Valley, I think it's, it's a mistake. Uh, I, 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 it, it's, not everybody could be a unicorn. Um, but again, it's a $420 billion market that is in the process of tripling. And where is it going to triple? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Uh, and, and I even step back a bit from talking money. Let's, let's stop talking about money. Everybody talks about the money. Um, let's talk about the problems we're solving. Let's talk about where we are in, in space as a species. We've got all this economics, trillions of dollars worth of equipment in low Earth orbit. We're going to get more people in low Earth orbit. And... We're already talking about sending stuff to the moon again and starting to build out our, our ecosystem. So, so human economy is slowly moving from Leo back out all the way out to the moon. Um, and how much further is it going to be? And in there are the opportunities for the new startups. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I mean, I didn't want to bring up the Silicon Valley model that way. It was more about uh, trying to say the the scale uh, which uh, at which the international supply chain or the growth that these companies can have kind of globally 
at the same time is something that uh, we don't see much uh, in the in the space industry as such so there's very little companies in the space industry that have products that uh, you know scale scale across continents and get used across continents at the same time yeah i mean the only way you would do that would would, would be to get um uh, a company doing data services right i mean that's going to be your satellite market uh more than anything else um and you know, that, that's why companies like Fleet and Mariota and, and companies like that get so much investor attention because their addressable market is, is global. It's huge. Um, and uh, if you're not doing that, if you're part of the supply channel and the, it's, it's, you know, you've only got like cube, cube sets is a $2 billion market. $2 billion for some of these investors is nothing. You know, I mean, it's, you know, why would they get out of bed? Uh, of course, I think the initial part of some of the VCs who invested in Australia include, uh, I think, Blackbird and a few others. What was the tipping point in you know having them invest? Um, well, I I, I think I, I I know where I thought it was. Uh, again, I'm not a member of uh, Fleet's team. Um, we did some work for them uh, in their earlier days designing their initial mission. And one of the things that Sabre does for, for companies that are in this, this seed and series A range is we do mission design, very high quality mission design. And we tie that mission design into a business plan. So we could take your overpass calculation, high fidelity overpass calcs, and give you a high fidelity addressable market um, based on that overpass. Uh, and it's, it's not too hard if you have the right tools. So we did that. And then as part of the due diligence, we hand that over to the investors, of course, with permission from uh, you know, Fleet. Um, and they asked us some pretty objective questions about how we felt about the, the team and how we felt about the, the uh, um, uh, business plan that they had. Uh, and whether that, I thought it was, and, and my answer was, look, the, the team's great. They pay their bills on time. That's important. You know, they've, they've, they've been really good. Uh, and, and I said, this, this business plan, these, these guys are addressable markets in the trillions. And here's the mathematical justification based on the orbits that we designed. Okay. So, uh, I was able to show them the path between the design of the orbit and the mission plan and how that mission plan tied directly into, uh, an addressable market valuation, valuation is the wrong term market size estimate. Uh, and it's it's high fidelity estimate based on overpasses. And um, I don't know if that was the answer that yeah they had their own negotiation, but that was a part of the 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 uh, decision. You talked about Series B and you know higher scale. One of the challenges that I see in India is uh, there are of course now some of the institutional investors that are investing in space as of today. Some of the companies have gotten you know, three, four, five million dollars uh, going for them in Series A now. There is a big gap with uh, continuing funding in India is what I see because uh, if you want to go get 10 or 15, it's almost impossible at this point of time with space being viewed as a high risk, uh, you know, investment in the institutional investment scene in India. So I think that's a very big uh, challenge that companies have to overcome to get that sort of a money to scale uh, to that level. So... What is the scene like in Australia? For oh, fascinating uh, that you mentioned that. It's the exact opposite. We are top heavy. Uh, institutional investing uh, for us would be like 20 million Australian to, to 50 million to hundreds of millions. So Sydney is a massive banking hub uh, for Southeast Asia. Um, and I've, I've talked to companies who are like, yeah, yeah, if, we, if I want to raise 100 million, I just pick up the phone. I'm like, nice to be you, <laughs> you know? But uh, to, to, to the, the angel investing is a huge gap here. Um, and there are a few kind of uh, series A and B funding groups that are available. Um, and sometimes an American investor could join in, but not if they're, they're the lead. They don't, they, American investors don't like playing in Australia just because, because if you're a seed investor, you want the startup to be very close to you physically. You want them in choking distance, right? But um, I, I, I don't know. I, I think my question back to you is these companies that are getting seed rounds and $5 million 
in India, why would they need Series B? Why don't they just go straight to customers at that? It's almost like you could boot once you get that, you should be able to bootstrap and, and gain revenue. Is my is my question? Yeah, but the question is, you know, what you call a Series A and seed and everything is so, so different in every part of the world, and you know what you can do with it is also very different in in every part of the world, right? So in India, I suppose if you you call a hundred thousand uh, dollars as a seed investment in the U.S., that's not even angel funding at this point of time, right? I've I've seen people in the U.S. tell me. A million dollars in funding is angel money nowadays. You, yeah, nowadays. remember Silicon Valley is different from the rest of America too. No, you you, you are right. Like the American numbers are bigger than the Australian. Uh, like an Australian uh, seed round would be about one hundred fifty thousand. In the U.S., it's like a seed round would be about two hundred fifty thousand. Um, and a Series A can be up to ten million in the U.S. Five to ten million for a Series A. I have seen some that are lower. Um, but in Australia, a, 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 a 15 million, 20 million, that's a series B in Australia. So yeah, we do got to be careful what we call them. One of the reasons there is also the size of the funds themselves, right? So you have, uh, you know, the size of the funds in case of the Indian in investors, uh, may be much smaller. I've seen fund sizes of something like 20 million, 30 million. I've never seen like, you know, fund sizes of more than a hundred million investing in any kind of space. Uh, company and so therefore, if you have a size, a fund size of like twenty million or thirty million, you end up investing, you know, like five hundred thousand maybe to to de-risk your investment. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this: What kind of companies are are you getting starting up in India? What are you seeing? I mean, there's a spread, nice spread across uh, everything from launch vehicles to you know building satellites to then building uh, you know ground applications and uh, there's all sort of companies there, right? So there's a very nice spread on all of them. But uh, the more aggressive fundraising uh, companies have been more the upstream than the than the downstream, I guess. And I see more the scope for downstream to grow in that sense in the future, but. Uh, a couple of launch vehicle companies have raised, I think, about five million each now, and uh, there's a couple of other, you know, satellite companies that have raised uh, a couple of million and so on. So the, that's more like the scene uh, of of where it is going. But you know, it's everything is in transition because uh, we haven't seen any aggressive testing and aggressive product uh, being put out as of yet from all of these companies. Okay. Well, I mean, they they do take time, so. You, you know, um, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. Also, uh, I think the the challenge also sounds like uh, getting customers. If if you're an Indian startup in space, uh, it's going to be hard to get an American customer. For the same reason why it's hard for an Australian to get an American customer, they don't want to spend money on you. Um, they'll they'll spend money on themselves, and to get into the Indian government, the ISRO supply channel must be pretty hard too. Um, so it's probably critical that 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 you get acquisition programs uh, within within both defense and uh, ISRO that you could plug into. And that must be pretty tough. It's like taking candy from a baby. <laughs> You're absolutely like, you know, he hit the nail on the head so well, <laughs> having seen everything. So there is no, uh, I keep telling people the same thing. Uh, the procurement processes in India has not changed for like 50 years in defense and space. Uh, so if you're a two person company, you know, working out of your parents' garage or a 10,000 people company, uh, you have to pay like, uh, a certain amount of deposit if you get a contract and you know there's so much of uh, oversight uh, and in fact if you are an indian company you have much more rigorous and a tougher process in the procurement process than you're a foreign company so if you're a foreign company and there's no indian technology involved or you know there's no indian company with the capability you might be actually it might be actually easier for you to sell to the indian system than as an indian company wow Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> it's really amazing. Yeah, and you know, if you're, let's say, you know, you're, through, you're producing a thruster or some other system and it's, uh, let's say the system costs you like half a million, you know, that, that's the procurement order size. And the rules of the procurement will say you have to issue uh, half the tender cost in bank deposits so that if something goes wrong, the government takes the money out of that. 
So now, as a startup, where will you get that money to lock away in a bank? That's horrible. That's, that's so difficult. That's so difficult. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it, it's the age old problem we have in the space industry to convince government to do things the way we want them to. Uh, and for, for, uh, for us here in Australia, there was always a group of people who said, why won't the government just do what we want? And you end up banging your head against a wall. And, uh, I think we're luckier because Australia is a really, I mean, we only got like, what, 23, 24 million people. So for me to meet a, a politician is so much easier than if you're in a, a country of, what, 1.2 billion. It, you know, it, it's, and, and I got lucky, right? I, I, I met a guy who knew, I got, but, but the funny thing is, like, after the ball started getting started rolling, uh, every person I talked to in the space industry was bragging about how they were having a meeting with with some uppity uppity politician. Every single one of them was like, I talked to so-and-so, I've pushed, I've convinced the government to have a space agency. Uh, you know, it's, it, and trying to imagine how you do that in, in a country as big as India, that's gonna be tough, man. It's a tough slog. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. And you're talking about a size of uh, a, a city state like Delhi compared to a country like Australia. Essentially, that's it. You know, the size of uh, and population of Delhi is like, you know, the population of Australia. Yeah, yeah. No, literally. Yeah, it's impossible. It's just like, how do you, how do you, how do you tackle that? How do you convince so many people? Like, like I had to convince like 12 people, right? At the end of the day, it was... It was a think tank with a couple of people who knew people. And the more people I talk to in, in Australia, the, the more everybody knows each other. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's so much more different. Like, I couldn't do this in the States. Like, for me to try and, and build a, such a big change in the United States, uh, as a U.S. citizen, I wouldn't have been able to do it. There's no way. It, it's just too big a, a beast. And, and trying to do it again in India. It, it almost sounds like you need to do what Australian startups did before the space agency. You focus on commercial, you ignore the government, you build a community, uh, you buy and sell from each other, um, kind of like what Fleet and Sabre were trying to do and Hypercubes and, and some of those guys back in the day. Um, and it's tough because when you're first starting out, you don't have money to give away to other startups. You don't want to do that. Yeah, that's a last resort. You're going to vertically integrate as much as you can. So um, it's really tough, but that's kind of what you got to do. Definitely. And when you are trying to, you know, substantiate all these policy changes and getting support to the industry, one of the things that you would need is, you know, hard evidence to say that there's a, a growing market here and there's a growing, uh, you know, base and we can have a play here, right? And uh, one of the challenges that, I, challenges that I see in India is that uh, we have kind of no evidence-based uh, policy making because we don't have actually any data that is open and transparent. We don't know, like, you know, a consolidated list, list of supply chain is not open in India. A consolidated list of, uh, you know, what is the value for the Indian taxpayer to investing and the return for on investment, the size of the market within just the Indian landscape is unknown. The end users of every program is kind of unknown. So there's a lot of like, you know, that kind of statistics that are really invisible. And that's because it's just that people have not taken time to collect all of that and put out that in the open. And that should kind of be the backbone of policy making, right? So were you able to, you know, like reflect on or bring some of that data live for the Australian market? Um not at first. I mean, we, we did have, have the, the, the connectivity with the other startups. Uh, and we, we also had uh, anti-data data points. So we, we, had comp we had individuals and lobbyists and companies who were saying, no, Jason's wrong. Don't listen to him. The, the numbers he's giving you are, are incorrect. It's, it's a lie. Uh, so one of the members of the, 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 the task force, the Tiger team, um, was very vocal of, of, about his pushback and, and uh, nobody would do business with him because he was so vocal about it. He ended up leaving for Europe. Uh, he, he's one of Australia's top space engineers, you know, in, in Australia's history, one of their top space en engineers, and they cut him down at the knees. So it is, yeah, the, pe the thing is you're trying to change a system which is already embedded. The people that are in charge of the system 
don't want you to change it because it's their money you're taking. So what we what we did was um, we focused on the opportunity. Uh, we focused on the global market. Uh, we were able to, and again, Australia had certain data points which were really easy to argue. So easy to argue, it was so logically crystal clear. People would say, we're a $3 billion market, look how great we're doing. And I would say, no, you're a $3 billion expenditure. And I would repeat that for two years straight. That's how long it took to start, start sinking in. The, the, the difference, that, and the ground game, of course, you know, getting that kind of negative pushback from the traditional actors um, caused the most damage, you know, and, it, and it, it, it made it a little bit difficult for our company. But at the end of the day, you know, our philosophy was we're, we know that they're not real customers, not yet. We have to focus on the available customers. So that was a saber story, not the rest of it. But but if if I were in your shoes and if if we were doing the same thing in India, um, you could spend a lot of time talking to government, and obviously you're already doing that. And they're obviously saying, "Well, show me how many companies are in India, because those are the ones who are voting for me, or those are the ones who who are my stakeholders." Um, and you turn it around and say, "This is a market that's going to triple in the next ten years." Don't you want to be a part of that? Do you want to see that money fly away? You, you know, and, and they're like, yeah, but yeah. And, and it touches agriculture and mining. You know how to make these arguments in the, you say space affects agriculture and mining, and then they turn right back to you and do what the Australians did, which is to say, yeah, but we just buy it from Digital Glow. We buy it from Planet. We buy it from pick an American company uh, and, and, and cut it in. And it does your market no good. Uh, and it's an argument that is that is presented by people who do not want change. And you, Narayan, in your community, you want change. So you have to build that change within yourselves. And you have to work together. And you have to work under the assumption that there is no government money available. Uh, and you keep in, in touch with them. And you work up until you find somebody with enough influence to go over the heads of the lobbyists. And that was the point for us that, you know, part of that, that, you know, think tank and, and task force and, and things like that is the lobbyists were not invited and the politicians were able to sit in and listen and hear an argument that made them realize that they were being lied to. And they'll never look at you in the eye and say, I could tell the other guy's lying to me. It's against their political interests. But they will process that and then they'll go back to the lobbyists and, and get them to retell their story. Then they'll go aside and they'll be like, they'll compare the lies with the reality. Okay. Uh, and as long as you keep it with the truth and the evidence behind the truth uh, is going to have to come from you and your community uh, and you're going to have to build it. And it's going to take a couple of years. And that's the, the, the truth of it. Yeah, absolutely. And that is what we see now in India. I think, you know, having pushed and shout for now 10 years, now we see some systematic reforms come into play, but we still don't have a clue as to, you know, what will be the the role of, uh, you know, the private sector and the new space companies to come up and ask for stuff for changes, because we've been told that there's going to be reforms, but uh, no one seems to be invited to give their opinion as to what is the change we want. Well, um Okay, I mean, for, first thing is, have you banded together a community? Uh, and do you know the size of your community? So you know the size of the new space community in India and how many companies are involved. So uh, how many, actually? How many Indian startups are there? At the moment, I, I think it's about 50 of them. 50? Yeah. It's not a bad yeah. number. Uh, it's quite good, actually. And how many have received investment? I would say about uh, at least 15 of them. So about the same ratio as, as Australia. About a third get investment. Um, okay. So making products, 
building more startups, showing your capability and announcing and making sure that, that the media is involved with every single success within that community, working together to self-promote yourselves, to get into the, into the, in being the voice in the ear of the government, that's going to be the most important thing. We, we have to take a lot of cues and lessons and uh, see what happens because I think there's a lot of lessons that we can take from Australia and, you know, how things have uh, moved there and, and take a lot of inspiration from, uh, uh, from what is going on there. And I wish, you know, we people in the system realized other ecosystems maturing and, you know, trying to replicate uh, some of that. Uh, even places like uh, Japan, where there's a legacy space program, you know, the space agency being very strong, is changing. And, and that's something that is surprising that uh, even with the giant like JAXA being around, they're opening up to more and more startups and more and more companies doing and trying to push for internationalization of their supply chain. Yeah, that's excellent. So what happened with Sabre in the last, you know, early days? Did you, how did you manage to survive? You know, were you, did you have any like backers or uh, what exactly happened from you like starting out in Australia and then, you know, going to the scale up mode? Um, well, I, I started up in research mode. I treated it like an academic postdoc. I was writing papers and, and doing research. Uh, I did it for about four years. We We were... Um, 2008 to, to 2012, we, we were uh, the only company looking at machine learning for space. We are the first ones that ever solved the diagnostics problem using machine learning. Um, and uh, we made a, we, we made very little in sales. We didn't know how to sell, you know, and, and we didn't get accepted to any proposals that were out there uh, because we weren't part of the kind of consortium uh, of, of uh, people who've been kind of embedded in in the cash flow for a long time. Um, but we were very good at what I call guerrilla marketing. We were very good at making the front page news of, in, in Australia uh, for some of our projects. Um, and the, the first one, we, we did the Space Beer Project in 2010, uh, ma making a beer you could drink in space, partnered with a, with a startup microbrewery in Manly Beach. Uh, made worldwide news. You know, it was the number one story in Australia for three days in a row, from in the sci tech section, number one science tech story. Uh, we had a few stories in India, which is pretty fun. Uh, you see, you guys might have heard of it at one point. Um, and from that, we we had national attention. Uh, we also got a lot of pushback. We had a lot of people calling us up and yelling at us for uh, taking marketing away from them and and making Australia seem less serious. I will never have a space agency unless they see space as a serious thing. And I just told them to, to fuck off, to be honest. I, it, 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 was, it was very kind of stupid kind of, excuse, excuse my language. I, I tend to be blunt. You, you, your audience might not know that I'm, I'm usually a pretty blunt spoken person, but yeah, I was really mad at that, you know? So um, yeah, four years of research, uh, but very public facing uh, the, the dragon tether, the electrodynamic tether, which India was our first sale, actually. Um, so we were making little sales here and there. Uh, it was a struggle. I, I ended up selling my house. So I invested myself in my own sweat equity. Uh, we were spending a lot of our time between 2008 and 2012 raising investment, and we raised exactly zero dollars. Uh, and part of the reason why is at the time, the Australian investors uh, were all web and mining trained, experienced investors, knew nothing about, they, they, they didn't see space as a valid industry. Um, but we were getting onto the, the top pitch competitions. So, you know, we were in the Tech 23 competition, uh, which is Australia's largest, uh, uh, at the time it was their largest um pitch event, uh, and, and we were in um, the space business plan competition out, at, out in the U.S. I was flying to California all the time, talking to investors, and they they liked the company. They liked us. Uh, you know, at one point, we were the special deal of the month for Space Angels, um, and, and it looked like it was going to happen, but at the end of the day, they all backed off. 
because we've got a company in Australia and a company in the U.S. Um, and they wanted us to have a holding company in Delaware, which is like the very Silicon Valley kind of thing. Hey, your company's here, but your holding company's in Delaware for taxes. And, and, and we knew if we did that, then we would not be able to sell uh, products in, in the other continent. So uh, at the end of the day, we, we ended up getting no investment. And I just dropped that whole process. Obviously, it's failed. I sold my house. Uh, I was six weeks from bankruptcy, by the way. Uh, it was quite dire in my household. You know, it was, I don't have any kids, so it's, it's not you know that bad. But it was me, the wife, and the dog. And the wife was like, time to get a job, Jace. Time to get a job. And so I was teaching fencing. Uh, I was an adjunct lecturer, which is like the, the, the armpit of the academic community. If you've ever, ever done adjunct lecturing, you know how much it sucks. Uh, and, um, yeah, it, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a struggle. And, um, but the thing is, why didn't I quit? That's the question. And the answer is because by the time 2014 came around, 2013 came around every year, the amount of customers I was getting was a little more, uh, the first couple of years, it was like, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, you know, 50,000 uh for the first couple of years enough for like a small research program at a university you know um yeah it's certainly not sydney salary uh and uh but by the time 2014 came around i was getting customers that that and 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 contracts we were doing leak detection for water utilities we were doing uh machine learning for downstream services uh and um in the meantime, building our product, our space product to the point where we could get bigger and bigger customers. And that's what we did. We just built trust. Took a long time. Uh, we built trust one customer at a, at a time. Uh, and um, I think in 2016 is when we really started to kind of gain momentum in terms of, uh, yeah, the fleet project was one of those that was really good uh, for us. Um, and we had a couple at the back of that used from larger space companies in, in the U.S. and, and uh, in, in Canada. Uh, so our U.S. company was, was starting to kind of grow a little bit as well at the same. You know, for a couple of years, we thought the U.S. was going to be completely dead. Um, but, but it all kind of comes back. If you persist long enough, eventually you build the brand up. People realize you're sticking around. But persisting for us wasn't just about being there, but also improving the cash flow every year, improving the relationships every year. Um, and I, I think uh, we had a couple of small breaks rather than a big break. Uh, and uh, next thing we knew, we were supplying to uh, contracts to U.S. Space Command, uh, now U.S. Space Force. Uh, we had we, we started getting Australia actually turned around and started a program uh, uh, a defense acquisition program where, where startups and SMEs can apply for, which is a big break for us in Australia. Um, and we ended up being the very first company to win. Them. So because we did so much good quality technical work, uh, we ended up being at the front of the, of the channel for the very first uh, contracts that they were doing. And so in Australia, our, our credibility went up massively. And in the U.S., they noticed that and started giving us contracts as well. Oh, the Australian military trusts you. We want to link with them with five eyes, so let's work together. Uh, and, and, yeah, nowadays, uh, you know, we, we won the $6 million contract to get the Mission Control Center uh, in, in, in uh, yeah, the, the um, Australian Space Agency Department of Industry. Uh, there's a special line I'm supposed to say when I mention but I always forget. So I'm, I'm kind of in trouble when I'm saying it right. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it, it's you know, funded by the D Department of Industry on, under, uh, under the Space Infrastructure Grant. I hope that's right. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll probably get yelled at by the media people. But uh, you, you know, so now, now it's, it's, it's changed. You know, we're not a startup any. We haven't been for a few years, but um, now it's, it's changed. Our, our, our credibility as a, as a company, now we really are servicing not just governments, but we still have that uh, desire and, and drive to make stuff that's normally given to governments useful to everybody as a democratized kind of a thing. 
So, um, yeah, that's the story, front end and back end. Nobody's asked me that before, by the way, so thanks. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, journey because uh, having uh, you know met you so many years ago and having followed you around for a long time and uh, uh, you know to to get things and to see you know uh, people who you know and who have gone through that uh, journey to become uh, successful is uh, fascinating always. And what is the what does the you know landscape look like in terms of challenges ahead uh, as you see it? Is it you know, hiring the right sort of people or, you know, managing other things. What is the, what are the challenges today? We, we've, we've always been lucky with, with our hiring rounds. Um, this is the first time our, our hiring round is getting a bit uh, uh, stressed um, because we, we've had such a good brand in, 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 in the public eye that, that for us it's easy to get good people. Uh, but the, we got to hire a whole bunch of people at once now. And, and so now we're starting to get through, okay, uh, this is, you know, we, we, this is a little bit of work now. Um, I, I think looking ahead, uh, the, the, the pressures are going to be, um, competitive in nature. I think, uh, we've been put on the radar of companies much larger than ourselves. Uh, we had a lot of competitive pressure when we were fighting for the mission control center, uh, grant and, um, like I, I fought for $2 million contracts before, and we had a few of those before we got this one. Uh, they were so much easier in terms of angst, in terms of like competitive angst. And this one was, was like a punch to the face. It felt, felt like I was getting punched to the face for like three months straight <laughs> until, until the uh, and, and the punching stopped the moment the, the applications were due. So uh, literally the day after the applications were due, I finally got to catch my breath. Um, so I, I think the pressure now is, OK, we're in this position uh, where we're serving national strategic goals on two continents. Uh, I need to find um, I, I, I want to make sure that that the work that I'm doing now uh, is completely relevant to other people, to other startups, to other companies, to other governments. And uh, my motivation's always been towards the companies and the building out and, and to say, okay, I built this thing. Can I make this thing actually solve the no kidding problems in the space industry to get us all to moon and Mars and, and, and be in the middle between uh, of, of this, the story of our future? where we're going to go as a species to, to outer space. I want this company to be pushing that. So that's, that's the pressure on me right now um, to say, can I turn this into I mean, not just it's one thing to win the, win, win the money and say, okay, I'm doing this thing for defense. I'm doing it for, for the space agent. And, and it looks good in your CV. I, I, I don't really give a shit. I don't give a shit anymore. I really don't. You know, you know what I really want Orion? I really want Indian companies to be able to use my stuff to, to be successful. I want the work that I'm doing in my life to be relevant to the rest of the world. That's what I want. So the final question I have uh, for you is, uh, what is the landscape looking like in the next uh, five to 10 years in Australia? What do you think will happen? How many companies do you see coming up? You know, what, what will be the scene like in five to 10 years? It's looking like about 120 to 150 companies, I think. Uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll peak between 120 and 150. Um, I think consistently you'll get investment for a third of those. Uh, I think the um, companies, the, the, the pressures of not doing space, there's still a lot of pressure to move companies from doing space to be like downstream services. I think we can, if we could solve that piece, then uh, I think Australia will be in a position to be a supplier to the space industry um, in terms of small satellite components, small satellite parts, in terms of uh, data provision, uh, and in, in, in terms of uh, like machine learning quality and things, things of that nature. Um, you're going to see a handful of companies that are really avant-garde uh, type space companies. and we don't really know what they're going to look like, but um, you know, some of them are already starting off. One of them is is uh, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna call them out. Neumann Space, 
you know, making ion drive you know, propulsion, really novel propulsion systems out of out of South Australia. Uh, another one um, uh, making you know new types of spacesuits uh, that also cross over with with the sports community. Um, you know, so you're going to see a lot of kind of uh, normal space companies, and you're going to see a few avant-garde ones, and that's what I predict in the next five years. That's a, that's really amazing, and I uh, wish you luck. Uh, and you know, you've kind of now become, I guess, the the grandfather of new space in Australia in some ways, going back from the last decade to the current decade, and you know, you know, we are soon entering the new decade. So you've seen it uh, now, d three decades spanning of new space in that uh, front. So. Yeah, well, there there are already new companies that are coming up to me. Said, Jason, I got to do it better than you. You're old school. I get to totally kick you out. I'm like, oh, great, awesome. I really am old now. <laughs> so the moment you hear hear some young buck coming up on you like that, you you, you know you, you you hit a milestone. It's all good. So I hope uh, you know we get to collaborate uh, between Indian companies and Australian companies uh, better, and then uh, hopefully you know there's a bright future where uh, people can work together more more and more together and. Uh, Thank you very much for taking so much of your time to, you know, having this chat with me. And Ryan, always a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Anything you need, let, just, just let me know. I've got your back, man.